My guest tonight, Roy Blakey, has been on my radar since I started the show last May. Roy has led a wonderful life and is the subject of a documentary called The Fabulous Ice Age about the 100-year history of dancing on ice and Roy's quest to save that history. Joining us in the studio is the director and producer of the award-winning documentary, Carrie Pickett. The doc is available on Netflix, Amazon, iTunes, and DVD. And without any further ado, I'd like to welcome my guests, Roy Blakey and Carrie Pickett. Roy, what a pleasure to meet you. Oh, my pleasure, Thank, my pleasure. Thanks for being here. Hey, Carrie, welcome back. Thank you so much, Paul. All right. I've had the pleasure of watching uh, the documentary, Ice Age, the 100-year uh, history of dancing on ice. Before I met Carrie, I found it on Netflix, and I just loved it. I got to meet Carrie about a year ago. We've got to be really good friends. We're both Northeast natives. And she said that not only were you the subject of her great documentary, but you were her uncle as well. A lot of talent in your family. So you grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Well, I was born in Tulsa, okay. but uh, very shortly thereafter, my father got a job in Enid, Oklahoma, and we moved there. Okay. So I went through all of my education uh, in Enid uh, through the, to high school. When did your interest in ice skating start, and what was your connection um, to the history of ice skating? Well, as a kid, I, was a, I loved roller skating in the streets of Enid, and uh, I loved uh, movies, so uh, I saw an ice skating scene in a movie that was so spectacular and so incredible that in that movie theater, watching that, I said to myself, I have to do that. That's the most amazing thing I've ever seen in my life. Those people s swirling around the ice and leaping, and uh, and they 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 had put uh, the ice was p painted black, so it was like a mirror. <laughs> so these beautiful uh, skaters in white costumes were mirrored, skating around. So from age ten, I knew where I had to go. I knew I had to get uh, become an ice skater and get into some of those incredible productions. That's a beautiful story. Do you remember what the movie was? Uh, Sun Valley Serenade. So what was your next step? You're 10 years old, you're living in Oklahoma, not a lot of ice rinks down in Oklahoma, I would imagine. So you're following, you are now inspired, following your dream. What was your next I have step? my goal, but there is a big obstacle, as you say. Right. No ice in Enid. <laughs> <laughs> so I um, got pr proper uh, ice uh, roller skating uh, equipment and uh, went to the roller skating rink r regularly and uh, got to the point where I needed some uh, guidance and I went every Saturday to Tulsa, Oklahoma uh, on the bus uh, to take lessons from a wonderful uh, teacher there and uh, so uh, I... Was that ice skating lessons then? Well, it, no, this, Just this roller was skating. roller skating. Okay. And I did do a few competitions, but that was so nothing to me because that wasn't a show, that wasn't a, a theatrical aspect of the mm -hmm. thing. Uh, so, but I knew uh, ultimately that I would have to get onto the ice. So, uh, my father worked for a university in Enid, and it was just self-understood that I was going to go to, to Phillips University uh, when I finished high school. Well, uh, I didn't go to there. I said to my dad, that's not what I want. I said, I don't suppose you would consider letting me go to Tulsa to university uh, where uh, Tulsa has an ice skating rink. <clears throat> I didn't say that about the rink uh, to my dad. 
<laughs> but uh, he said, try me. <laughs> and we were in the car, I think, the next day to Wonderful. drive to Tulsa. And he uh, uh, found out all the information from the uh, people running the uh, University of Tulsa. And so I... Uh, g got to stay in Tulsa and uh, work on my ice skating. It's the same technique. It just mm -hmm. you don't have that eight pounds on your feet right. like the roller skates are, you know. So uh, I did. That's where I first got my toe in the ice <laughs> to <laughs> sort of speak, to, right? To get uh, toward my, closer to my goal. Well, I was very much more interested in the skating than my university cl classes. But I, I lasted that two and, two and a half years, and uh, I, I said, you know, I'm going nowhere here. Right. I, I, I'm I know the so feeling. much more interested. <laughs> I, did, I did the same <laughs> thing. It bounced me out too, Roy. I get it. <laughs> Small, what we used to call the tank shows, a little portable ice rink about 20 feet by 20 feet would be put in a nightclub or a beautiful theater restaurant someplace and they would do a miniature ice show. They were always in a five-star, four-star hotel. The audience loved those shows and for the hotel it was great to keep people there. That was around, you know, 1915, 1920. But Prohibition came in in 1922, knocked them all out of business. And so they didn't have any of those kinds of shows until 1933 when the Prohibition was repealed. And they came back stronger than ever. San Francisco, Chicago, New York, all had in their big five-star hotel had a ice skating production. It was just fabulous. I got drafted because I wasn't a student anymore, and uh, they whisked me off to uh, Camp Polk okay. in Louisiana. And the only thing I remember was that the air was always full of smoke. Something was burning, the trees were burning or something. For the entire time, my basic training there, that's my memory that I was in a fog. I've been so lucky and thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Instead of shipping me off to uh, Korea where they were all shooting at each other, I went to Germany. I have had so much good luck in my life. Hmm. So I'm here in, I'm in, in uh, Kaiserslautern, Germany, and I find out that there is a leave and recreation uh, center in the Bavarian Alps below Munich uh, where the military people could go and uh, ride horses and play tennis and uh, ski and skate. There's a big r skating rink there. Uh, and uh, one of the glories of uh, Garmisch Partenkirchen, Germany, for the uh, American so soldiers was that there was a nightclub that had an ice skating show. Wow, a nightclub with an ice skating built show. Built by the United States Army, uh, erected for, you know, uh, to serve the uh, uh, people coming in for the, their vacations. And uh, so I said, hey, let, uh, my buddy, buddies, let's go to Garmisch and see this uh, ice skating show. So we all, uh, I think there were three other guys, and we went down. And I took my ice skates with me, and uh, <laughs> we saw the ice skating show. It was wonderful inside. It was like uh, a 20s mo uh, mo uh, movie, right. uh, three-tiered uh, places uh, for with tables uh, where people could eat and have uh, drinks and things, uh, uh, and a big, big, big dance floor, and uh, an 18-piece orchestra, live music. Wow! And uh, uh, when it's time for the ice show, they pushed a button, and the uh, uh, dance floor receded underneath the place, uh, the tables where they were. Lovely. Uh, I think it was a. Tw 50, 60 feet, feet long and uh, 40 foot wide uh, uh, stage for the ice show. It was 
everything. You must have thought you were in heaven. So, and it, the building for the nightclub was right next door to the uh, Olympic Stadium where the 1936 Olympics wow. were held. And Sonia Henney had won her third gold medal in that building. Historic. So, so uh, I was skating there for our two or three days that we were there. And I said, get over there to that Casa Karaoke nightclub and tell them you'd like to have an audition. So I did, I wrote a little note and I took it over and left it for the uh, woman who was the director there. Before I even got back to my hotel room, I, as I, I wandered back and when I got there, the guys said, they called from, they want you to come and audition for the ice skating show. Wow. I said, Oh, they probably saw me in the big rink, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I, of course, set the whole thing up. So I did go in and audition, and despite the fact that for over a year I hadn't had any skates on, right. uh, I didn't, skated for her, and she said, I think I can use you in my show. She said, well, you, um, here, write down where you're stationed and the job that you do, and I'll see if I can get you transferred. For any... Um Anybody, not just kids out there, that want to get a little inspiration from my guest, Roy Blakey, you were inspired at 10, you followed your dream through happenstance, you ended up in the Bavarian Alps next to a nightclub with ice and an Olympic um, skating rink from 1936. You audition, you hear nothing, you persist, they call you back with a contract. If that is not the American dream by way of the Bavarian Alps, I don't know what, what, what is. I applaud you for your persistence, Roy. <laughs> well, I'm this high off the air, off the ground right. in the air that my dreams are all coming true. Wow. So I go back to Kaiserslautern to my unit and uh, I'm looking down my nose at all those uh, officers thinking, <laughs> ha, 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 I'm not long for this place. I'm going in show business. <laughs> Shortly thereafter, I was drafted into the army and taken off to Germany. I was very lucky, fate took me to Europe. I learned that there was an ice skating show sponsored by the US military in a leave and recreation center in Garmisch Partenkirchen, Germany. I went by the nightclub and left a note saying I would like to come and audition for the Casa Carioca ice show. So I went in and she said, I think I can use you in my show. She sent me a contract and uh, the U.S. Army kept me until midnight of my two years service. And uh, the next day I took off for the Bavarian Alps and my new career as a professional ice skater. Well, that was every dream I had ever had in my whole life coming true before my very eyes. I want you to meet two gingers Irish whiskey. I'm Kieran and I'm Irish, so I tend to like a challenge. Why not? I wanted a whiskey to help find me out what's out there. Like what's really out there. And I found the oldest distillery in Ireland with a water wheel and awards for its small family of whiskies in the middle of Ireland. As I've always seen it, you can't win the lottery unless you buy a ticket. So try it. The investment is small and the flavor is big. Now it's perfect for drinking neat. Its character holds up, like the Irish, when the bastards try to get you down. Two gingers Irish whiskey. Distilled twice for more character, time for more flavor, and less of the old burn. No litte bastard is carborundum. Don't let the bastards get you down. What can you do with so much space? The Solar Arts Building in Northeast Minneapolis. A masterpiece of exposed brick, wooden beams, hardwood floors and natural light. This unique multi-use space is perfect for a variety of events. To literally top it off, there are over 100 solar panels on the roof, making the Solar Arts Building self-sustainable. 
You've got the need, we've got the space. The Solar Arts Building, 711 Northeast 15th Avenue in beautiful Northeast Minneapolis. Give them a call at 763-234-5069 or send a message to mike at solarartsbuilding.com. So I had to go to Munich and get a passport and all those things that I was a civilian again. And off I went on the train to uh, Garmisch Partenkirchen to start my career as a professional With your skater. skates. And I uh, skated there for 18 months. And I said uh, to the woman who ran the uh, show, uh, you know, as much as I love it here, I'm going to have to get back to the States. So what did you do in the show? That you Everything. Got to okay. She was so wonderful. Uh, she it would work every afternoon w with the skaters if they want to make a new... Uh, uh, choreograph a new piece. Choreograph a new piece just for them or for them an apartment, a partner. He, she would put, uh, pick somebody, said, you, you two should skate together because you're the right size and she's blonde and she's beautiful and he, you're tall and handsome. Uh, I didn't get that said to me, but anyway. <laughs> Oh, you're a pretty good-looking uh, guy, right? I uh, did little comedy routines. Oh, you did? Like things. what? Oh, uh, she had a, a number that she choreographed for uh, uh, one of the girls and myself. And we came onto the ice uh, in uh, street clothes and uh, skated around and then went to the back and the curtain opened and there was the dressing room. So we both take off our uh, street clothes and we get into our clown outfits. So we had the, the big ba baggy pants and sure. the ruffle thing around the neck. And then we did a little uh, uh, be a clown. We skated to be a clown, that kind of a thing. To the 18-piece orchestra. Yes, to the 18-piece orchestra. And one of the orchestra uh, members was Tullio Mobilia, who wrote uh, Volare. Really? Uh, was uh, playing in the orchestra. This is the beautiful six degrees of separation that you only find on <laughs> Wall of Power TV. Boy, that's amazing. I'm going to be able to use that is in saloons around the country as I travel. Tul Tulio Telling that Mo story. Lo Tulio Mobilia. Wow, beautiful name. <laughs> Uh, the, the, with the GI Bill, you get uh, your education uh, funded uh, as an ex-service person. Right. So uh, I, I, I say to the lady, I've got to get back to the States. And so mm, I'm saying to myself, well, I had a year and a half uh, career as a professional skater. You know, I should be very happy about that. So I'm just, I'm just about to leave. Um, I've got a week or two weeks or whatever still, and I run into her in a coffee shop, and she said, uh, I have a little good news for you. And I said, what is that? She said, well, I've got you a new job at the Conrad Hilton Hotel in Chicago where they have a, an ice skating show in an a elegant uh, theater restaurant in wow. the hotel. And I was there for five years. I went to Chicago and uh, five incredible years. Two shows a night, seven days a week. Wow. <laughs> Do you ever buy lottery tickets? Because I'd like to go win on some lottery <laughs> tickets with you. Because you are a very lucky oh, man. Oh, you're, 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 that's only the beginning. I mean, uh, every way I turn, look what I run into. This gal that makes yes. this movie. This was the major form of entertainment for the American public. Hundreds of thousands of people from all over would go. It was huge. It was exciting. It's something we should be very proud of. It was all about being in the ice show. We knew right where we were going. We were going to perform and perform and perform and have a great career. The ice was all painted black. There was a film of water over it, so it was like a mirror. And there were beautiful girls and boys skating in white costumes all around Sonia Henny. And I said, that's the most incredible, magical thing I have ever seen in my life. I have to do that.
Carrie Pickett, my northeast neighbor, and uh, my good friend, you're making your the first person to make two appearances on Wall of Power TV. All right, I feel super special. Yes, and you've had a great run now. I follow you on Facebook. You've been winning uh, uh, several awards at film festivals with uh, First Daughter and the Black Snake. Yes, I have. It's yeah. been really wonderful. Where 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 was the, your latest appearance? I know you were down in in Winona for the Frozen River Film Frozen Festival. Frozen River Film Festival gave the film the best Minnesota made documentary award and um, the Red Nation Film Festival in LA gave me the Courage Award for the film and the award is a beautiful uh, statue that is golden like an Oscar except it's a statue of a Native American woman and it's so formidable and so beautiful that I feel like I won an Oscar. Well, congratulations. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. Well, we know how you got a little bit of your courage from your, your lovely Uncle Roy. When did uh, you decide to do a documentary on Uncle Roy? Well, I have uh, Roy to thank for a number of aspects of my career because when I moved to New York City in 1982 following college, I went to pursue my dream of making it as a photographer and I think my mother always felt that I had a shot at it because Roy was a professional photographer, his second career. And I didn't a, starve to death. <laughs> was a second photographer so she knew it was possible. And so I moved to New York City where Roy had a loft and he let me stay with him the first two weeks of my stay wow. in New York City. What, and part, then, what part of the city? He, his loft was on uh, 6th Avenue and 24th Street. I know exactly Chelsea. where that is, yep. In Chelsea. And so Over a topless bar. <laughs> Billy's, Billy's topless. It, I was a, a photographer for 30 years, in part because of Roy's inspirational nice. career as a photographer. And then um, when in 1993, Roy moved out of New York City after 25 years in New York City, he moved to, to Minneapolis, we got a building together so that we could share a photography studio. And he could have a place for his Ice Stage Archive collection of memorabilia of the history of theatrical figure skating. And so every time a filmmaker would come to see me or I would have people come to the studio, I would sort of say to them, well, don't you think that this would be just a great film on this history? And because of Roy, I learned that the ice shows dominated live entertainment for four decades. Right. There was no greater form of live entertainment, more widely loved and widely um, attended as the ice shows. And starting about when? In 1940 with the, um, really starting in 1930, started in 1936 with Sonia Henney starting the Hollywood Ice Review and our own local Shipstads and Johnson from St. Paul doing the first traveling show of the Ice Follies in Tulsa, Oklahoma. Wow. And that great Bob Dylan line, take what you have gathered from Unfortunately, I was in Enid at the time <laughs> when they, in 1936, when, when they did their first performance there. Uh, made the first traveling ice show. Wow. Invented it. Yes. And so there was this. From St. Paul. And right. So because of Roy, I learned all of this amazing history. And I kept going, oh, you know, somebody really needs to do a film about this. Right. And, you know, Roy is um, perpetually young. But right. I was looking at the clock going, hmm, right. I better do this myself. Right. And so I bought a, a, a camera. You ain't giving any younger. <laughs> I, who, who is? Nobody is, exactly. So I bought a camera and I got the software, editing software, mm. and I taught myself how to become a filmmaker. Wow. And it took me almost eight years to make um, The Fabulous Ice Age. And I went to, to over Which five. Which is what, about an hour and 10 minutes long? It's Yes, it's 72 minutes long. Wow. And I went with Roy to all these figure skating reunions in Vegas, in Europe, all, all over. And I, bec and I learned that even though the figure skating might have been a small portion of somebody's ch life chapter, mm -hmm. it really, for many of the people who were in the ice shows, defines their life. Right, oh, yeah. it was the highlight. And it was their highlight. And so then I learned that all these people were so excited to see that I was doing this film because it had never been, the story never, had no never been told before. Touched it.
This program is brought to you in part by Iron Range Resources and Rehabilitation. Grumpy's is the place to be for Art of World and our 20th anniversary bash on May 19th. Super Chunk comes to Grumpy's Northeast May 19th to promote their first album in five years, What a Time to Be Alive. Join the fun May 19th for Art of World 2018 and jam with Super Chunk at Grumpy's Northeast. What was your big connection then with the Traveling Ice Show? So how did that start? Well, after my five years in Chicago in the Conrad Hilton Ice Show. I gotta ask you real quick about that because I love the history of Chicago with all the great jazz and blues down there. But I imagine there was some luminaries that came to see that show at the Conrad Hilton. It really was uh, primarily the uh, business people who came, stayed at the hotel while they were doing business in Chicago, and hey, they have an ice skating show here in right. this building. We don't have to go any place. You know? right, right. Uh, that was the, the backbone of that. But, right. but occasionally we did get uh, you know, p p people, uh, famous people, but uh, sure. it wasn't a big deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, at the end but of... But some great musicians, though, I bet. Uh, while Chicago. I was at the Conrad Hilton, uh, a man from Minneapolis um, who owned uh, um, ice skating shows called Holiday on Ice came, uh, and I was introduced to him. And uh, I said, uh, oh, um, if you're ever looking for you know another guy f to skate in your show, I would love to... Uh, have a contract, so they he said, "Oh yes, absolutely. We have a new show preparing in France, and uh, if you're available, then you, uh, you you've got a contract." And so this is uh, Morris Schalfen. Uh, his name was M Morris Schalfen. He was this guy who uh, uh, was in the sports business and the. Uh, he owned uh, the Lakers. It, oh really? Yes. Okay. And uh, business and. Um, Nankin. Many buildings in downtown Minneapolis okay. are, are, were his. In fact, one guy told me he rode through the city with Morris and showed, that's mine, that's mine, <laughs> that's mine. But Nankin was their family's. Right. Uh, and I understand he had dinner there every day or lunch every day when he was in Minneapolis. At the time that I met him, he had something like four different units of his Holiday on Ice wow. shows. what an uh, entrepreneur. Two in the North America, uh, one in South America, one in Europe, and one in Asia. Wow. I worked uh, for Morris Schalfen uh, for about eight years and went to 40 countries, uh, traveled uh, uh, twice around the world. Uh, You're making me jealous now, right? <laughs> <laughs> 